Welcome to the 226th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today is a discussion in part of the partnership with the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest of Villan Villanova University. And my guest today is Merle Eisenberg, a historian and the co-host of the Infectious Historians podcast. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live, Periscope, and we're still experimenting with Twitch and hopefully we'll have that up and running today. You can hear COVID calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. Please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, February 23rd, 2021, there are 2,480,794 deaths globally from COVID-19. That's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 501,947 deaths reported in the United States from COVID-19, and that's up from 499,902 reported yesterday. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is, it decimated our staff. COVID ravages black and brown health workers in the United States. This is written by Danielle Renwick, published on the 30th of December, 2020 in The Guardian. In the spring of 2020, New Jersey emergency room nurse Maritza Beniquez saw wave after wave of sick patients, each wearing a look of fear that grew increasingly familiar as the weeks wore on. Soon, it was her colleagues at Newark's University Hospital, the nurses, techs, and doctors with whom she had been working side by side who turned up in the ER, themselves struggling to breathe. So many of our own co-workers got sick, especially toward the beginning. It literally decimated our staff, she said. By the end of June of 2020, 11 of Beniquez's colleagues were dead. Like the patients they had been treating, most were Black and Latino. We were disproportionately affected because of the way that Blacks and Latinos in this country have been disproportionately affected across every part of our lives, from schools to jobs to homes, she said. Now, Beniquez feels like a vanguard of another kind. On the 14th of December, she became the first person in New Jersey to receive the coronavirus vaccine was one of many medical workers of color featured prominently next to headlines heralding the vaccine's arrival at U.S. hospitals. It was a joyous occasion, one that kindled the possibility of seeing her parents and her 96-year-old grandmother who live in Puerto Rico again. But those nationally broadcast images were also a reminder of those for whom the vaccine came too late. COVID-19 has taken an outsized toll on Black and Hispanic Americans, and those disparities extend to the medical workers who have intubated them, cleaned their bed sheets, and held their hands in their final days, a Guardian Kaiser Health News investigation has found. People of color account for about 65% of fatalities in cases in which there is race and ethnicity data. One recent study found healthcare workers of color were more than twice as likely as their white counterparts to test positive for the virus. They were more likely to treat patients with COVID-19, more likely to work in nursing homes, major coronavirus hotbeds, and they're more likely to cite an inadequate supply of personal protective equipment, according to the report. Black healthcare workers are more likely to want to go into public sector care, where they know that they will disproportionately treat communities of color, said Adia Wingfield, a sociologist at Washington University in St. Louis who studied racial inequality in the healthcare industry, but they also are more likely to be attuned to the particular needs and challenges that communities of color may have, she said. Along with people of color, immigrant health workers have suffered disproportionate losses to COVID-19. More than one third of healthcare workers to die of COVID-19 in the U.S. were born abroad, from the Philippines to Haiti, Nigeria, and Mexico, according 
to a, guy, a Guardian Kaiser Health News analysis of cases for which there is data. They account for 20% of healthcare workers in the US overall. Dr. Ramon Talaj, a physician and chairman of SOMOS, a nonprofit network of healthcare providers in New York, said immigrant doctors and nurses often see patients from their own communities, and many working class immigrant communities have been devastated by COVID 19. Our community is essential workers. They had to go to work at the beginning of the pandemic, and when they got sick, they would come and see the doctor in the community, he said. 12 doctors and nurses in the SOMOS network have died of COVID-19, he said. Dr. Eriberto Lozada was an 83-year-old family physician in Long Island. He was still seeing patients out of his practice in New York when cases began to climb in the spring of 2020, originally from the Philippines, a country with a long history of sending skilled medical workers to the United States. He was proud to be a doctor and proud to have been an immigrant who made good, his son James Lozada said. Lozada's family remember him as strict and strong-willed. They affectionately called him the king. He instilled in his children the importance of good education, and he died in April 2020. Two of his four sons, John and James Lozada, are doctors. Both were vaccinated in December. Considering all they had been through, John said it was a bittersweet occasion, but he thought it was important for another reason to set an example for his patients. This makes sense to Patricia Gardner, a black Jamaican-born nursing manager at Hackensack University Medical Center in New Jersey, whose family colleagues and she herself have all been infected. A lot of what I hear is, how is it that we weren't the first to get the care, but now we're the first to get vaccinated, she said. Like Beniquez, the nurse in Newark, Gardner was vaccinated on the 14th of December. For me, to step up to say, I want to be in the first group. I'm hoping that sends a message, she said. M. King Smith, a friendly EKG technician who visited friends of friends or family whenever they ended up in the hospital, was also interviewed for this article. Beniquez said she felt the weight of that responsibility when she signed on to be the first person to receive the vaccine in her state. Many of her patients have expressed skepticism over the vaccine fueled, she said, by a health system that has failed them for years. We remember the Tuskegee trials. We remember the appendectomies, reports that women were forcibly sterilized in the Georgia ICE detention center. These are things that have happened to this community, to the black and Latino communities over the last century. As a healthcare worker, I have to recognize that their fears are legitimate and explain this is not that, she said. Beniquez said her joy and relief over receiving the vaccine are tempered by the reality of rising cases in the ER. This is from December. The adrenaline she and her colleagues felt in the springtime of 2020 is gone, replaced by fatigue and weariness of the months ahead. Her hospital has placed 11 trees in the lobby, one for each employee who's died of COVID-19. They've been adorned with remembrances and gifts from their colleagues. There is one for Kim King Smith, 53, the friendly aforementioned EKG technician who visited friends of friends or family whenever they ended up in the hospital. There's also one for Danilo Bolima, 54, nurse from the Philippines who became a professor and was the head of patient care services. One for Obina Chibuze Eke, 42, the Nigerian nursing assistant who asked friends and family to pray for him when he was hospitalized with COVID-19. Each day we remember our fallen colleagues and friends as the heroes who helped keep us going throughout this pandemic and beyond. Hospital President and CEO, Dr. Sharif El-Nahal said in a statement, it's a 12th tree. It's going to be for whoever else we lose in this battle, Benikez said. Okay, I'm going to turn to conversation for today and very happy to speak once again with Merle Eisenberg. Let me introduce him to you. He's a postdoctoral fellow at the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center at the University of Maryland. He received his PhD in history from Princeton University. He's published articles in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Historical Review, and Past and Present, among other venues. 
He co-founded and is co-editor of The Middle Ages for Educators. It's designed for teachers, students, and members of the public who want to learn about late antiquity in the Middle Ages. And he received a grant from the LePage Center for his weekly podcast, Infectious Historians, which discusses historical pandemics and disease while also discussing some pressing questions today. And I'm so pleased to welcome Merle Eisenberg back. Thanks for coming on COVID Calls, Merle. Thanks so much, Scott, for having me. Really appreciate it. So I would uh, like to start the way I usually do and hear from you where you're calling in from today and how the pandemic situation is looking there. Yeah. So this is unusual for me because I always usually ask my guests the same thing on our podcast, um, probably for a similar reason um, to get a local flavor. So I checked uh, this morning and the number of cases in Annapolis is about uh, 80 a day. This is down from a height of about 350 or 360 a day on average uh, in the middle of January. Um, so definitely going down. Uh, schools in Anne Arundel County are supposed to open um, March 1st or thereabouts. How that exactly is going to happen is unclear to an extent, as with many places. Um, but what struck me actually, as I was thinking about it, is I, I often talk about my kids, and it's interesting to me how adaptable my children have been to this pandemic um, in terms of being so good about wearing masks. Um, we go to the local bakery down the street, and they know to stand in the little orange dots that are six feet apart, and they go from orange dot to orange dot um, wearing their mask. And uh, if anyone approaches them or isn't wearing a mask, they always ask, you know, Daddy, why aren't they wearing a mask? Um, so it's it's been an interesting experience, um, but we're also the state capital. So I've seen protests uh, during the summer, obviously, and then also open up the schools kind of protests um, as well. So you're, you're based in Annapolis. And yeah. um, so what's happening at the Naval Academy? Are you able to observe anything that they're doing? So the Naval Academy is basically because they're a military organization, they just kept all the midshipmen and midshipwomen on the campus and basically don't let them out. And that's how they've managed to do it and told them all they have to wear masks at all times, which basically has worked. They're teaching mostly remotely though, um, in terms of their actual teaching though, uh, just like most other campuses at this point. Um, so they're on campuses and they're in their barracks. In they're their in their campus. barracks. And when you see them come out, they're all in, you know, mm -hmm. issued white masks, as you would expect um, mm -hmm. whenever they're allowed off. off uh, it's interesting what you said about your your kids. And I can report the same from my house, that when you want real public health enforcement, uh, you need a 12-year-old. Um, because, you know, um, they've had to learn rules and comport themselves to rules they don't like. And why shouldn't you? Yeah, no, I mean, they're, you know, they see someone approaching them down the street and they say, someone's coming down the street. We need to like go into the driveway over there to stay away from them. Um, what that will mean in five, 10 years, I'm a little worried about, but for right now, it's a good sign. For right now, and it, it brings to mind, of course, previous public health campaigns in which there was concerted effort, for example, with smoking, um, to message it through the schools and, and reach the kids who would then message it message it back home. I'm sure there'll be a lot of research on on the way, um, particularly as schools reopen, um, education works through the schools about, about COVID. Well, um, we have a lot to talk about. I want to talk about your podcast. I do want to start um, by kind of refreshing, because you were with several guests, including Lee Mordecai, who's your co-host for Infectious Historians on a previous episode of COVID Calls. But I wonder if we could just refresh a little bit kind of the the core of the work you've been doing, the research work um, over these last couple of years and particularly through the pandemic year. And you just published uh, with Lee a really tremendous piece in the American Historical Review, which everyone should check out. Could you just um, set the stage for us a little bit? We'll talk about that piece, mm -hmm. but it's about the Justinianic plague and the kind of the long life of the plague, if you will, um, the many lives of the plague. Why have you sustained and how have you sustained an interest in pre-modern pandemics? Yeah, so this is a great question. I never set out to do this. Um, the first article we uh, published on this was, was in past and present. It came out in August, 2019, and it was supposed to just be a one-off thing. And as we did more research, as, as you probably know, and many of your listeners know, things develop over time and you get more and more interested in these questions. So, what the initial work does is it looked at uh, the Justinianic plague, which is 
the first of the three major plague pandemics. This is caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis. Um, the first is the Justinianic plague, which is roughly given the dates of 540 to 750 CE. The second one is the most famous one to many of your listeners, which is the Black Death, which lasts from several centuries thereafter. And then the third one is what's just called the third plague pandemic, which starts sometime in the late 19th century and ends generally sometime in the late 20th century. And what our work first looked at was what are what's happening during the Justinianic plague, right? It's often said to basically cause the fall of the Roman Empire and the ancient world, all these very big stories. And so what we wanted to look at was, is this the case? And we went through the evidence from the time to show, I think, that that is not really a good, strong case for that. But what got us actually more intrigued over time, and this is where the AHR article was focused on, was why did we come to think about that, right? How did we come to think about these great pandemics of the past as profoundly changing all aspects of history, whether it be culture, economics, politics, states, you name it, right? And the plague is plugged in, right? That's not something that's done for modern pandemics, right? We can discuss a little later how we think COVID will fit in or might not fit in, but I don't think anyone's saying that COVID is bringing about the fall of the United States. I mean, maybe people were in decades to come, but certainly not right now. So just to dive into the article a little bit, so you kind of laid down the the history and, and in a sense, the case for continuity, which we'll talk about. Um, and and as you talk, and I think about you know textbooks that I've read and taught over the years, and the Justinianic plague as a sort of a device which is helpful to use at the end of a chapter or a section. I think to say, okay, we're going to move on from this part of the world now in this period of time. So we're going to kill a good chunk of everyone, and then we then we move on. Uh, events, uh, disaster events, even over a couple centuries, um, serve us well or poorly, as you might argue. Um, as historical markers. So we'll come back to that. But I want to dive in. I'm just going to um, read mm -hmm. a couple of sentences from the piece. Um, I don't know how you apportion the writing if you're both great writers or one of you is a great writer and the other feeds data. I don't know, but it's so beautifully written. Um, you say right. at some point over the 20th century, so now we're talking about Justinianic plague, but much later, the idea of a plague wave changed from a solely temporal idea into a discrete event which affected multiple distinct geographical locations. It occurred through a process of slippage, you argue, in which scholars misinterpreted earlier references to waves. In short, the wave metaphor changed from a temporal to a spatial meaning. So I mean, there's so much packed in there, the way we use language, the way we perhaps misunderstand or misconstrue usage of language in multiple passings, historiographic passings, but then also just back to the evidence itself and what we call a wave, uh, what we don't, what's background uh, deaths. So talk a little bit about this part of it, because I, I really found it fascinating. Yeah. So, you know, what's in the back of our minds a lot of times is we have to make a leap when we just say plague, as, as you gave in the example of textbooks, right? So that there's a difference, a slippage between what we think plague does and what we have evidence for it doing, right? And this could probably hold for many diseases. But in particular, plague, obviously, because it doesn't even just mean, you know, Yersinia pestis, it kind of just means a big pandemic, a big disease, whatever you want to call it. This has a particular weight to it that if you just hear the word, it does something to our thinking. And that's kind of in the background of most of this. And how we track this in the article is to look at, basically, I'd like to think almost everything that's ever been written on the pandemic across the last 150 or so years. And then I got a little tired, um, I'll admit. And... What we looked at was how this idea developed over time. And what was pretty key to this pandemic was uh, geographic. Uh, it has to be a large geography um, and you connect dispersed events together. And I'll talk about how waves do that in a second. You have to have a significant mortality, right? Because in a pre-modern world, you have to just kill a lot of people, as you said, to create change somehow. How that happens is actually never explained. It's just lots of people die and things change. And then you also want a large chronology, right? So it has to happen for a very long time in order for it to be a large impact. And one nice way to connect that together is through this idea of waves washing over, right? So just think about the example you were reading in the opening segment. Someone used that exact term, waves upon waves of patients came to the hospital. And what I think they meant is just lots and lots of patients kind of continually were coming, cresting and, and reducing over time. But really the idea of waves has become 
kind of ubiquitous and I think are a language and it's really taken on its own power, but it doesn't actually have an anchor anymore in meaning anything. Um, and what we could see in the, it's really epidemiological research at the early 20th century when it came to plague is that initially it actually had a very seasonal temporal location to it, right? That you'd have these waves driving up and down during particular seasons. And after a time, it basically took on a geographic sense and then it kind of transmorphed from there into just anything almost, right? So that you basically had waves where you'd have an outbreak of a disease in say Syria, an outbreak of a disease in Spain, and they're suddenly just connected together because, you know, they are. And then you try to connect the dots and make that happen even though you have no evidence to do that. There's so many um, contemporary historiographic trends also which, which might pressure that or reward that, let's say to a certain extent, and one of them is is something that I think we mostly applaud, which is taking a global view that we, we are looking for global trends. We are looking for causalities over long stretches of time. And I wonder what you think about that, because that seems to have perhaps been one of the, the motivating factors for some of the slippage you were just talking about. A wave here in numbers then becomes a wave in location. And the next thing you know, we've we've turned it into a global event. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I mean, the the causality of what the plague does in any given instance or any disease in terms of long-term history is very difficult to do, right? I mean, how do you link the Justinianic plague that breaks out in Constantinople in 540? Somehow it's been linked to the early Islamic conquest, which happened 90 years later, right? And so drawing that linkage is very difficult, but it's very easy and it's very sexy, right? Because you know the empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, will eventually get mostly conquered by the early Islamic conquest. So maybe plague does something to that, right? Just as in the Western Mediterranean, you know that the economy gets reduced, there's fewer people around. So the easiest explanation is you just kind of shove a disease in there as a black box event. So you don't actually have to explain what happens. And it's just a nice, easy, neat explanation to a really difficult uh, causality chain that especially once you go back to late antiquity and the early middle ages where you have far less evidence, um, starts to fall apart pretty quickly when you try to connect those events together. So there's another part of the piece where you talk about um, what you term plague truisms, things that we rely upon to tell these stories about the plague. And uh, you don't dismiss them, but you contextualize them, which I like. I wonder if you could say a little bit about these truisms, and I want to zero in on paleogenetics. Sure. So truisms was one of the great debates Lee and I had when we wrote this article, right? What to term these things? Because they actually are what we call empirical interdisciplinary evidence, which is obviously a mouthful. Uh, so we didn't want to use that as the term. So we needed to come up with something to show that it's not a fact, right? But that it's a thing that we all think. And again, that doesn't express it. So we came up with that term. Um, and so these are things that, you know, there's some great artwork on this, actually often from video games um, about this. So when you think about plague, the first thing that probably pops into your mind, or certainly my mind, right? We've all read or at least read articles about Camus at this point during COVID is rats, right? We often think about climate change having something to do with plague. And we often think about uh, paleogenetics, right? These are three really important things and I'll touch on the paleogenetics in a second. but. None of these three things actually prove that a pandemic changes life radically, right? I mean, something like rats, we're not even sure rats carried plague at this point, right? I mean, they're a potential host. But what people will now do is you go looking for archaeological evidence, you find some rat bones and you say, I found rat bones, thus there must be plague, thus society must change. Now, there's a whole host of actual issues like how you date the rats and all this stuff that we can just put aside for now, but rats don't give you the evidence, neither does climate, right? We don't actually know the connection between um, why plague emerges and climate, right? And it's, it has to do with very local uh, micro regional effects that we haven't worked out, you know, in 2021. So I don't think we've worked them out in, in 541 either. Let's stay with this and go a little bit further with the paleogenetics piece. I had uh, Monica Green on as one of my guests yesterday, and we had a really great discussion. She has a piece in the same issue of AHR, um, and the two pieces really, I mean, I'll teach them both together because they really um, establish some nice shared problems and questions. You, you share some evidence, but you move in different directions too, which I think is incredibly useful. Um, 
And I think she's, in our conversation in the piece, she's pretty humble about what you can accomplish with ancient DNA. But she's insistent that we have to take it on board as a body of evidence. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you... Sorry, I know I froze there for one second. I'm sort of curious what you think about using paleogenetics, what kind of conclusions you can draw from it, what can you do with it, what can't you do with it from your point of view? Sure. So I think uh, Monica and I would absolutely agree that paleogenetics is a pivotal, extremely useful, um, and wonderful new set of data, set of sources, however you want to frame it, uh, to be used in pre-modern uh, explorations of pandemics, pathogens, disease, medicine, you go on down the line. Um, it can give you uh, evidence of plague transmission routes, right? So you can look at the development of the actual DNA and see how it evolves over time to see where it may have started, how it may uh, develop, evolve, change, et cetera, et cetera. You can find plague in places where you don't have written sources, right? So that you may have cemeteries, uh, famously, at least in our case, in Bavaria, right? We have no written sources from Bavaria from the 6th century, but we know plague was there. So it's not everywhere. We've only really done Western Europe. Um, it's extremely expensive. Uh, it's part of certain institutions and not others. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there's networks and there's alliances and there's all types of things that go into it with any, as with anything. Um, and so it's an extremely useful tool. But my take on this, and the article says this, I think pretty clearly is paleogenetics actually doesn't answer uh, many of the historical questions that at least I'm interested in. Right. I mean, we all have our own questions, but I'm not really interested in where a disease uh, originated. I'm not interested exactly uh, in how it went from place to place. What I'm interested in more broadly are cultural effects, human effects, uh, social effects, economic effects. Right. These are the type of historical questions that I ask. And in that sense, the paleogenetics doesn't answer any of those questions. Right. It doesn't tell you how people reacted to it, right? The wonderful stories you read in the beginning, you can't get that from ancient DNA, right? It's not gonna give you that. And then what I'll also just add is how it's a truism um, is because the paleogenetics articles, which are authored by scientists, need historical frameworks, right? Mm -hmm. So what they do is they take the stories that have been digested uncritically, um, you know, of death and destruction, and they use that as their story and they slot in their ancient DNA into that story. And so in some senses, they're not actually changing the narrative, they're just rebuilding the same narrative with new tools, is what I would suggest. It's interesting because at the end of my conversation yesterday with Monica, um, she alluded to that and to the, the need for interdisciplinarity and on these paleogenetics teams that there should be some kind of, I don't, she didn't say this, but a sense of like, you, you can't do this unless there's at least a historian in the room to offer, to push back again on this sort of framings that um, make plague into something which has to be a punctuation mark. Yeah, I mean, the question I have, and we say this pretty explicitly at the end of our article is, I don't know if interdisciplinarity is quote unquote the answer because the problem with all these teams comes down to, as it does in many instances, money, power, and how the networks are set up, right? These, off, these articles are almost always first authored by the actual paleogeneticists, right? Not by the historians. And there's ways in which you can build interdisciplinary teams. And that's where I'm at now at the National Associate Environmental Synthesis Center. That's what their job is for the last eight or nine years is to build those teams from the ground level. But often usually how the paleogenetics is done is the historians just kind of tossed in at the end. And so there needs to be more, I think, collaborative work from the beginning rather than just kind of taking everyone's views on board. So just to return to the Justinianic plague, and I guess this is my last question about this, if, it, if it's real, but if it's not the sort of epoch-making um, mega event that the historiographic uh, tradition over the 20th century makes it out to be, what, what's lost by giving up on that narrative frame? Because there's a lot of great history that gets done even though we might disagree with the sort of headlines or the marquee, um, you know, Ronald Reagan ended the Cold War. Uh, I, I'm not going to go there with you, but I am interested in the Cold War and geopolitics in the 1980s. And so you can do work underneath that banner. And sometimes even that banner brings funding that might not be there otherwise. There are pressures, perhaps even things to be gained by using it. 
discuss with me a little bit how you think about the pros and cons of taking down the marquee. <laughs> well, I should say uh, on in some level, you're watching this play out in real time. Um, I wish, as I said at the beginning, that, that Lee and I had from the beginning said, this is going to be our research agenda and this is how yeah. we're going to attack it. We're going to come out with the big book, right? I mean, the, our field works in certain ways and certain yeah. expectations and you're watching us just kind of come up with new ideas as we move forward. Um, but that is the key question, right? Is what to do. And the first thing, as I would say, is, is the debate needed to happen, right? Basically, before we started publishing on this, the debate was, uh, well, there was no debate. Essentially, it was 5% of people just saying, this is a big deal, and 95% of people saying, okay, fine, whatever, I don't care about, this is a question. And so I think by provoking the debate, what we're actually starting is a longer conversation, and that will certainly play out probably as, as history takes a long time to play out over the next decades. Um, and you know, I'm sure there'll be good responses to our work, and I know that people are working on that. But what I'd say is, you know, what we need to think about is those long-term causality and to build up the, the micro histories from the ground up again, rather than just blanketing the whole thing with death and destruction. I am perfectly happy is not the right word, but I'm perfectly accommodating to a debate saying, you know, we have good evidence from Constantinople in 542 that it was had massive effects. It had some economic effects, had some cultural effects that's perfectly reasonable, right? And so you build up that story. And then there's a story that I work on with my separate work, which is on Southern France, right? And that there you can see that basically one of the main cities that was probably hit most significantly seems to decline in cultural and economic terms and probably plague does play a role there. So if you start to build up those more nuanced stories slowly over time, what you then have is exactly like you said with your Cold War example, you have a much more variated uh, example of what's happening. I'm really interested in in how you might use that um, set of ideas to think about the now, think about COVID, uh, to think about a half million Americans and well over two million people around the world having died from from this disease. And and yet there's always this um, this discourse, well for me there's always this discourse about not wanting the importance of it to rest on the numbers. And so there's this tension that I feel and others feel every day. I read the numbers on every COVID calls, but I read them with some trepidation because I don't want that to be ultimately the deciding factor as to whether or not people think this was important or not. And it seems like you've you've had that, you're having that discussion with the ancient past, with the pre-modern past. How does that then refract back onto the, the pandemic as it is right now? Yeah, no, I think that's a, a really good question. I mean, I've reflected upon my work, obviously, uh, over the last year or so, um, certainly during uh, COVID and, you know, as it, as it spread. The, the two things I would say that I think that are useful to think with that people have done when it comes to pre-modern pandemics is I would call the first two buckets that people put forward the first six months or so were, you know, lessons from the past and uh, hope for the future, right? And so that, you know, there were lessons we could learn um, none of these, of course, were followed. None of them, of course, were done. And so that's one group of things um, that I was fairly dismayed to see, right? I mean, you could see all these things that people proposed, obviously, 1918 influenza being the most famous with flatten the curve and all these things that were not really executed, even though all the data was there. Um, the second thing I think the pre-modern pandemics teach us is to an extent that the hope idea um, is not really the way forward, right? I mean, this is often thrown around fairly constantly, I would say, in the discourse that, you know, after the plague, you got a renaissance or that, you know, this is almost sounds funny now in retrospect, that uh, somehow this pandemic will level inequality, right? That this was actually thrown around in the discourse very early on. Build back um, better. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so that, that what you actually need to do is all the hard work um, through this process. And that's kind of what I hope some of the, the Justinianic plague work has also done, which is to not make this a flat experience right? And that individual stories matter. Now, in the sixth century, we don't really have the individual stories for the most part, right? I mean, we almost know of almost no one who dies of the Justinianic plague, interestingly enough. But what we can do is, is talk about how communities were building themselves up and trying to figure out what to do and how people thought about this differently moving forward. Just a reminder, you're listening to COVID Calls, and I'm talking today with Merle Eisenberg about the Justinianic 
Plague and about the historiography of Plague. And we're going to turn our conversation now to talking about a project he's been doing um, with his co-host, Lee Mordecai, which is the Infectious Historians podcast. Um, so uh, I love talking on a podcast about other podcasts because it... <laughs> People are going to go listen to it and and grab the episodes and enjoy them. I know as much as I have and learn as much. I, I want to get a little bit of the backstory here. I think you started the same time I did, more or less, back in in 2020 or in COVID time, a long time ago. The long what march. Gave, yeah. What gave you the idea to start this project? You know, I I went back through my notes to try to figure out what the impetus behind this was that I couldn't actually find the exact thing. So I wonder if Lee and I just talked on Zoom about it. But I think we were genuinely curious about other histories of disease, right? I mean, we had written a, an op-ed in the Washington Post in early February using um, some of the AHR language. It wasn't out yet, obviously, but using the language to think about it. Um, we'd been thinking and are doing a project when it comes to media and movies and pandemics, actually. And so we've been broadly uh, curious about the topic. And what we wanted to know were, you know, one thing that seemed pretty obvious is historians of disease were actually very isolated in their own time periods. And so we just wanted to talk to other people working on pandemics to know what kind of evidence they were using, what kind of questions they were asking, right? I mean, my field, as I just described, is kind of obsessed with this how many people died question, um, which is not really an interesting question and isn't even solvable anyways. Um, <laughs> with the numbers we have, it's just not solvable. And so what we were interested in were uh, some of these broader questions, whether it be the Black Death or the 1918 influenza pandemic. And then the second element, which I admit is somewhat dropped off, but we also wanted to talk about uh, modern implications. So way back in April, we had uh, my colleague here at Sasink, Fuchsia Hoover, on talking about uh, environmental and uh, equity questions involving the African-American community already back in April. And so those were a number of those topics we were really just interested in kind of talking to people and figuring out what is happening, is this a field, and so forth. So if you would, and again, well, first of all, I should just ask, um, how can people find the podcast? So let's take care of that business, Infectious Historians, which has also been partially um, funded as you developed it by one of these grants from the LePage Center, which COVID Calls has as well. It's really great to acknowledge them and their, their support. How do we find the work? Yeah, so you can find us on any uh, iTunes, as you uh, said in the beginning, iTunes, whatever uh, version of podcast. We also have a website, just infectioushistorians.com, where you can find the episodes. You can uh, get more reading material if you're curious about a subject. So we always ask our guests for three to five things to read, um, a combination of open access and public facing stuff, because we know we have a diverse audience who obviously doesn't have a university library necessarily. Um, and so that information is all there. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, our initial goal was to do big diseases, whether it's be black death, influenza, cholera, um, typhoid, sleeping sickness, these types of things. Um, but we've kind of expanded from there as much as we can globally, as well as putting in new kind of episode arcs as well. I wonder if you might tell us, um, I'm sure all the guests have been great as I've learned from every one of these COVID calls, um, but, you know, sometimes a guest will say something or take you down a narrative path or frame something in a way that just stops you short. You say, wow, I just had no, I just didn't think of it that way or just didn't know that fact. And, and I've had that happen many, many times on COVID calls. I wonder if you've had that experience. Yeah, I think one of the ones that stuck out and I kind of knew it was going to happen because I had randomly found the talk a few months earlier, but uh, Guy Biner, um, who's based in Israel, works in the 1918 influenza pandemic. I listened to that one. Yeah. yeah, he he essentially, our AHR article was framed as, you know, it has to do with how 20th century people think about disease, which is very important to how the Justinianic plague was framed. And he'd come to the same conclusion. We obviously don't read each other's work whatsoever, but his thinking on remembering and forgetting, in particular, uh, the 1918 influenza pandemic is really just the way to think about that pandemic, I really think. And so when he was talking, I went, man, he has figured this out. This is like really good. Um, what, what's been the experience of, for you both, of talking to historians whose work you might know well? And I ask that question as a person who also does this, you know, because historians work at great lengths. Nobody, very rarely do people tell us 
to cut off the word count or we we know how to operate within <laughs> word counts which make the average person uncomfortable shall i say um but you know a podcast has got to be within a, a time frame in in maybe an hour uh, and so i wonder as you listen to your guests as you talk to them as you frame questions um how, what's that relationship feel like between having unlimited time to talk about a problem versus really getting into it in an hour yeah, I think it's a different skill set that, you know, Lee reminds me, our most popular episode is our general introduction to plagues in human history, right? I think this has been assigned for numerous courses, people have told us. And it was also the second episode we recorded. And so it's one of the worst recordings we've actually done, which is funny because Lee tells me we need to re-record that every time I say, no, we can't do that at this point. <laughs> but as you said, you learn, right? And you frame moving forward. I mean, one thing that we stress to our guests is, which I'm trying to do now, and you can tell me later if I'm successful or not, but short 30 second, 45 second soundbite answers. And then let the person naturally follow up from there. And I think it's a skill set that honestly, historians really need to learn, right? Talking to the media, talking to more public facing content. And so this is a really good way to practice, um, I think, moving forward, because we edit our podcast both for, you know, if you say something outrageous that you're like, I probably shouldn't have condemned the provost of my university mm -hmm. um, in the middle of my tenure case or something. Um, and, you know, also just for, you know, ums and all that kind of stuff. So just to, to go into that a little bit more, because you're just saying maybe this is something that historians really need to jump in. I think we can extrapolate across humanities and social sciences. Um, and yet, at the same time, as you know, um, making the podcast is it's it's real work. Um, framing the questions, having the, the discussions, doing the editing. And it's also pretty demanding on your guests. I mean, you know, they have to fit this into into their busy and increasingly busier schedule. So develop that case a little further so that then I can use it when I talk to potential guests, because I'm always at pains to really explain why somebody would take the time to have these sort of meta level discussions. Yeah. So first thing I'll say is, and I don't know if this is your experience, the closer of a friend you are to us, the more likely you are to say no to us. I found that experience that if we approach people we don't know very well and we say, hey, we really like your work, that they're usually very flattered and they will come on. If I go to my good friend who works in, say, historical epidemiology and say, can you come on the podcast? They'll say, eh, I'll do it in a few months. Um, but uh, the case, I think, is, you know, for me, it's pretty clear, which is a, a constant gripe I see during COVID, which is we have all this expertise as historians, social scientists, but no one's taking us seriously, right? No one's giving us a seat at the table, right? We might say. So how do we do that? And I think the only way to do that is to, at a first level, simply reach more people, right? You know, as a, a colleague of mine who has a podcast on Byzantium says, you know, uh, his podcast, each episode is listened to more times than someone reads any of his books. Right. And so if you have some security, not that I do as a postdoc, but, you know, it's not a bad thing to do and it's not a bad new challenge to try, right, to try to get across your information as quickly as you can. But one impact is certainly uh, to spread this sometimes very esoteric, very specialized knowledge in, in your case, you know, history of medicine um, to spread it more rapidly among the community of historians who can't read everything. I mean, even reading through one uh, one volume of AHR is it can take you a long time, right? So, in with time and scarce supply, it serves that function certainly within the profession, and maybe it helps the interdisciplinary discussion a little bit. But what about one level up? And and I ask this of you again because I'm I struggle with these questions myself. What do you think is the broader impact of this kind of public facing historical work, or what can be the impact? Well, I think what can be the impact is the ability to, as I said, reach new people. I think there's three broad buckets I think we need to think more uh, in terms of operating. And this is kind of a new theme that Lee and I are exploring at the moment, which is policy implications. And so I think there's three ways this can be done. One, you have to do good work, right? Research, that's something we're all used to, right? You write a good policy version of your work. The second thing, I think we have to set up networks, and that's what I think, you know, you've had probably not 226 different guests on, but 200-ish different guests on, or you probably have a number. 
And so just building that network, right, is really important because you never know uh, who you can reach out to again. And the third thing is, as I say, is, is building a media profile and building uh, a way in which people reach out to you and you become a go-to person. And I imagine that's happened to you over the course of these calls that people are more interested in hearing your take on various subjects because you've now talked to hundreds of people, you know, and even if you only gain a couple lines here or there from people, right, a couple lines 200 times repeated is you have a mass of knowledge that you wouldn't have had by just reading several hundred books even sometimes. I think that last point is a really interesting one uh, to me, particularly because of the perception of academics. Um, I can't speak globally, but I can certainly speak to the United States case. Um, and I think it's less so here in South Korea, where I am now, which is kind of interesting. Academics are more plugged into the policy process here. I'm talking about humanities here. Um, but an idea, um, and unfortunately perpetuated in the media, um, mostly by the media on the right, that academics are aloof, they're out of touch, they're out of step, um, they hide in the ivory tower, and we could say more and more of the things that are repeated. This, to me, seems um, kind of what we're engaged with, maybe not directly. Like, I don't do this as a way to talk back to Sean Hannity, <laughs> but I do think, like you said, just bringing knowledge forward in a format where somebody um, can feel like a college professor or another expert in another domain is, is accessible to them. Is, wants to educate them. That's a powerful act. I think we sometimes don't think about how powerful that act of reaching out really, really is. Whereas buying our book for fifty dollars from a expensive um, university press, that feels, I think, to some people like a hostile act to a certain degree. Yeah, I mean, I would say at least how I listen to podcasts, right? Is so one of the ones I download all the time is the New Books Network, right? Mm -hmm. And that can get overwhelming because there's like 50 new podcasts a week. But if you just listen to five, 10 minutes here or there of a few of them, right, that you just have an interest, you actually just learn about a whole new field right away. And, you know, I do it as I drive my kids to daycare, for example, right? So that's 15, 20 minutes. And it's just a nice way in which you can, you can get a new base of information. You know, I think one way forward, as I said, is really engaging with people. And that's something that I think I'm hopeful when it comes to COVID that people have realized that there's all this information out there that no one really took seriously, right? And you didn't uh, examine your maybe epidemiological models. Um, we had Lucas Engelmann on our podcast uh, about a month or so ago, who's doing a history of epidemiology. He's just started a new European Research Council grant on this. And he pointed out kind of how uh, UK uh, modeling didn't consider nursing homes, right, in any of their models. And so that's obviously going to be a problem. And lo and behold, that's where, you know, I don't know the percentage of deaths, but that's a huge number of deaths right there because people just didn't think through the implications of it. Um, and so that's where if you put more people at the table or at least have discussions where you have pipelines to those people, you can have different views on many of these topics. I think that's an, an important. I know in the disaster research space, um, there's always, this is probably true in any, in any sub-discipline or discipline, people do want to be able to feel that they're impacting public policy formation and well how do you document that well if you go looking for linearities you're going to be in trouble i mean this kind of comes back a little bit to our previous conversation um there's not a whole lot of academic books or articles even of really well-known scholars that then a senator calls that historian and says you've just changed you know um my new senate bill but if you take a more granular look, people who are great policy historians can show these changes and linkages over time, and but it's not linear. And, and so that can be dispiriting, I think, to maybe humanists who want to wade into this space and see impact quickly. Yeah, no, I think everything is about being able to distill your ideas, unfortunately, into short, you know, or shorter, amounts of information and then make them accessible in such a way. I mean, I think of uh, Mike Van, who uh, wrote a book on the great Hanoi rat hunt we had on our podcast. And, you know, he's cited all the time as an example of perverse economics, right? This is not what Mike intends to do, he tells us, but he cited all the time. And so what he did was he decided to write a, a graphical history of this, right? And it's a fantastic graphical history that somehow works in Foucault uh, into the graphical history. Um, 
it's just extremely well done and I recommend it to everyone. And so if you think in those ways, if you think in different ways, there are ways you can impact policy. It just can't be on a one-to-one, you know, as, as Sink would say, you can't just take your information and like a dump, you know, like a garbage truck, just like open up the back and try to unload all the information because that's not how people process anything. That's not how I process stuff. So you need to figure out other ways of, of networking and building in new skill sets. But do you think that uh, graduate students and early career scholars such as yourself need to develop these skills on top of everything else. I mean, I was having, again, this conversation yesterday. It's like, do you, uh, it's hard enough to get through a graduate program in the humanities with the expectations that are already there. But now the expectations to develop new methods, um, to develop uh, new skills in you know, broadcasting or podcasting, public communication, science communications, it's asking an awful lot, isn't it? Yeah, I think what we can do and you know in the humanities where there's you know no jobs relatively speaking in the in academia certainly not this year um is there's ways in which you can put people or not put people but people select different tracks that they want to go down and I've seen some good examples of people doing this work when it comes to assignments right so rather than assigning a standard research paper of 25 pages as a second year seminar paper that no one's going to publish and you spend hours and hours of work doing, maybe you learn to develop uh, a media plan, right, for outreach. This is something for our uh, Proceedings to the National Academy of Sciences paper. Lee and I spent a lot of time putting together uh, a media outreach plan for that, right? How to reach out to media. And at the end, we put together in a 20-page white paper, which we gave out to other postdocs we work with, how to approach the media, how to write a press release, how to do talking points. Um, when to contact the media, how to pitch the media, all these things, you know, that we learned because we had some time to figure it out um, to do, right? And these are things we can all learn. And if you then decide, like many people decide not to become a professor, uh, this is an extremely valuable skill set that then you can learn, right? If you know how to do communications, that's a transferable skill across really any profession. Um, so that's a useful outreach. That's fascinating. What was the reaction among um, the other participants who got the white paper presumably and and worked with you on it uh so the people on the paper because this was a science paper so there were uh five or six of us on the paper all told um you know were very grateful they'd never seen something like this before um even the the scientist we worked with the paleogenesis he had never seen or at least did, said he had never seen something as well put together before but the reaction has been one of our colleagues who i think is working on another paper in a high prestige journal is using that as the template to do his own outreach moving forward, right? I mean, we get very mad in the pre-modern world that all these paleogenetics discoveries, for example, make all the headlines and we get no headlines for what we're doing. Um, so one way to combat that is to build that skill set up, right? And so I think the more we spread that knowledge around to historians, the better off uh, historians and other social scientists really will be. So I think once you know what to do, I think people have been very grateful. The other postdocs in my department have said they've used it. Communications team at Sasink has used it, I know, um, mm -hmm. as an example of outreach. And so I think that's a key way moving forward. And there's another piece of this, which has become more and more clear to me over the pandemic year, um, which is also that we, we just have to take for granted that having um, evidence-based, factual, um, argumentative in the right way, history out there, um, which can inform the public policy debates and can inform anybody who happens upon your podcast. Um, we shouldn't necessarily, uh, we should really hold that in very high value, higher than ever, because of the disinformation and the conspiracy thinking that's out there. There are other sources of information to fill that vacuum. And, and so to me, it's another reason that people should feel confident that it matters if they take that work, as you said, a book or an article, and figure out a way to talk about it with people who are not their academic peers. Because I, I really do think at this time, it's, uh, I don't wanna use a war metaphor, but there's a battle going on over um, how we do frame these events. And it's, academics are underrepresented in that discussion, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think it brings up another skill set that I don't have, right? Which is, you've probably seen, just like I've seen, because I get them sent to me about once a week from some member of my family, is these graphical abstracts of pandemics in history and their impact, right? With like dots on how many people they killed or whatever. One up yesterday. 
Yeah, I mean, there was one up on the Washington Post yesterday. This is what I thought of it because I got four people to send it to me because <laughs> they know. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's being able to even just create a graphic like that, right? Even just being able to communicate that, hey, maybe putting numbers with giant circles kind of isn't what we want to do here. There's other ways we can think about this, um, you know, things like that. Um, you know, one of the graphics I was passing around for a long time probably still exists. I think it's on Visual Capitalist, if I remember correctly, you know, had all these dots of number of people dying. And I remember for the Justin Anik plague, they had a little arrow saying, this number is under dispute. Um, <laughs> no citation to us, I think, if I recall. But I thought, man, we've done something because we got a little, we're the only ones to get an arrow saying this is debatable. So that, that was a win. Uh, Every other pandemic is, is a closed case. It's, it's, yeah, it's, apparently. It's, <laughs> the community of historians have voted and it's, it's absolute. Um, I think that... That's interesting and funny, but it also points to another thing that um, is a challenge as historians move more into public facing discourse. And it's been in the news a lot this year with Dr. Fauci and others who have sort of lived their science lives in public. We're not certain about everything. And in fact, arguing about those uncertainties is really at the core of what the historical enterprise is, is about when it's functioning well. I think maybe a lot of people don't they call that revisionism. And so they don't like that idea that you would go back to the pre-modern world and dredge these questions up. Why can't you just let that history be? Getting people excited about that, that argument is part of it too, I think. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think if you stop thinking about these past you know, events, whether it be pandemics or something else, as closed cases, you can think about them as different ways and different ways people live through things. You know, one of the things I think I want to point out with the Justinianic plague is that people in the past didn't just, you know, sit there and die, um, right? They weren't just like, hey, that seems fun, right? They actually did things within their own knowledge base. Now, they didn't have vaccines. They didn't know it was a bacteria that was killing them, obviously. But there were ways they tried to adjust, right? I mean, famously in the 542 outbreak, right, they instituted an entire new, you know, administrative agency to basically deal with the number of bodies they had to bury, for example, Right. So that there were ways in which people were trying to figure these things out. And I think that's really important to stress that these cases aren't closed. They aren't just like obvious events and that, you know, we can reassess these things. You know, as historians, we have no problem, you know, to an extent revising what people came before us uh, did. But obviously, you know, that becomes more complicated as it plays out in the public sphere. Talking to Merle Eisenberg today. Sorry, I just cut out there for a second talking with Merle Eisenberg and we've been talking about plague histories and we've also been talking about history and the in public discussion and about podcasting. Um, we're almost up on time. I just wanted to get one more um, piece of that in, Merle, because I know you're also engaged in um, reaching out to educators with your work as well. And you have a website that you've been engaged with called Middle Ages for Educators. Say a, a little bit, if you will, about that, because I think that's another application for this kind of podcasting work, certainly in the college classroom, but also in, perhaps in the K through 12 classroom as well. Yeah. So this is Middle Ages for Educators, um, which originally was started by, by myself and two other colleagues, uh, Sarah McDougall and Laura Morreale. Um, and what we realized is probably many of your listeners and you yourself probably realized is, you know, the way in which we were teaching online or we've all been teaching online for almost a year now doesn't really isn't the same as teaching in person. Right. There's an obvious thing to say now. But if you remember back to last March, everyone was trying to just lecture at their students for 50 minutes through Zoom, for example. And so what we did was we put together a website that collected as many resources as we could, right? Because a lot of libraries are closed. So there's resources for researchers. Um, and then there's also uh, teaching, there's videos, right? So some of these things highlight really interesting, fascinating examples that I never knew about that you can teach. So we have an example for, of a 14th century trans woman, uh, which is a video explaining it, the resource, the primary source, so you can read it, you can share it with your class, you have further resources. So there's all these uh, different resources that can be done uh, for the college classroom. Um, what we're thinking now, and I think is actually very important, is people have reached out to us and said, uh, from the middle school and high school level saying, hey, I have to teach about you know the fall of the Roman Empire. And I know I'm not supposed to say that it fell and that like the barbarians did it. But that's about all I know, and I don't want to go on Wikipedia to find that. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me what's the deal? Um, and so what we're putting together is a list of starting 
um, in New Jersey um, because we've gotten a bunch of uh, money to redo the site from Princeton, uh, and that's where it's housed now, although run independently. And so uh, we're retooling this, working with some New Jersey-based educators to see what are the questions you have to answer in a middle school and high school classroom, and how can we give you resources to answer those questions? That's great. I mean, it's another example of where you're, so probably people might not think, well, that's what I need to do to get tenure, but that is what they might be thinking, like, how am I going to make impact with this work? Now, bringing those two into the same conversation is not something we're going to accomplish on this podcast, but we really need it. We really need it. Yeah. I mean, it brings up the the other thing, which we've talked about a number of, of people on our podcast about uh, John McNeil, uh, professor at Georgetown, former president of the AHA, you know, the, this question of collaboration, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been talking this whole time that I've done most of this work with Lee, um, right. you know, and people ask me all the time, well, how much of this do you, did you write? Right. Or, uh, you know, which parts did you write? And it doesn't really work like that. But in the humanities discipline, we're still taught to do all these things very much independently. And I think that's another thing that kind of needs to be problematized as well. Again, as you pointed out, the problems of tenure and the problems of getting a job are, are key here. Um, and I can't resolve that as someone who doesn't even have a tenure track job. But, you know, that's an important thing because Lee has a skill set that I don't have, I have a skill set that Lee doesn't have. And so by bringing us both together, we can actually do better work. Oops, one of my kids has tried to come in. Right. No, one of my kids isn't. Um, and so <laughs> that's a skill set that uh, both of us um, can do in some regards. Um, and I think this is true of anyone, right? I mean, you could write probably better uh, global histories um, if, you know, you brought someone who knew Arabic and if you had someone who knew Greek and someone who knew Latin and someone who knew uh, Chinese and et cetera, et cetera, and bring them all together to write one thing. Yeah, the best we do with that usually is the edited volume, which presses usually don't want um, and which are a real bear to create. But real collaborative work, co-authored works is a different thing. And speaking for myself, are much more, much more impactful as a learning enterprise, not just as a writing, as a writing enterprise. Um, I, I have to just note there that your partner or whoever just did the room, uh, extraction, um, well, that was very skillfully done and um, everyone's welcome on COVID calls. And I hope next time I have you on, maybe your daughter will actually come to the mic and say what it is she wanted to talk to you about because it looked like she was ready to talk to you. Yeah, all I could think of was about halfway through, I realized I forgot to lock the door uh, and that they might come in. And I'm that- I didn't lock it, it was great. Yeah. Uh, so my daughter's used to coming in because she will often see people on Zoom now, um, yeah. her grandparents mostly. Well, um, we're up on time and, and I just want to um, remind everybody you've been listening to COVID calls and you can catch COVID calls every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And we're continuing our uh, LePage discussions tomorrow as well. And I want to thank Merle Eisenberg and by extension, Lee Mordecai and the others that you collaborate with so um, much enjoying the podcast uh, and your article and all the work you're doing. It's just kind of astounding all the work you're doing at this time. Thanks for your time today, Merle. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on, Scott. I really appreciate it. Stay healthy, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow, five o'clock.